Hello and welcome to video two for week eight. In this video, I'm going to introduce Kepler's law, laws of orbital motion, and then we're going to prove the first law. This might be a slightly longer video than normal, since I want to do the entire proof of the first law, and it gets pretty involved, but hopefully you will stick with me. So Kepler's laws of orbital motion. Satellites in orbit around a large gravity source have elliptical orbits, and the large object, the fixed object, is at one of the foci of the ellipse. The radius sweeps out equal area over equal time, and the period, the time it takes for one full revolution of the satellite, and the major axis of the ellipse satisfy a relationship that the period squared is proportional to the ellipse cubed, and the constant only depends on the mass of the central object. So these are three observations that Kepler made simply by watching satellites in orbit, watching things in the night sky, and trying to figure out what the properties were. Kepler predates Newton and the calculus by a significant period, roughly 100 years of my history's memory is good. What we're going to do is we're going to prove Kepler's laws from Newton gravity, Newton's laws of motion, and the definition of the force of gravity that Newton gave us. And really one of the reasons that Newton's laws of motion were so successful is because they can do things like this. They can derive observed properties like Kepler's law from their basic mathematical foundation, That's what makes them so remarkable. And we're doing this to show sort of how parametric curves and motion in three-dimensional space can give us this type of observational law, Kepler's law, from the tools that we've developed in this course and previous courses. So let's talk about orbits. The setup is going to be, we're gonna have some large object with mass capital M, which is much, much larger than the mass of its satellite. And we're gonna fix that at the origin. And we're gonna have the position of the satellite with mass little m be determined by a parametric curve given in polar coordinates. So gamma is gonna be some curve depending on time. And we're gonna determine gamma by its radius r and its angle theta. And we'll determine the reference point of the angle as we go along. So that's the setup. So we have some curve. I'm actually gonna let this curve be in three dimensions in cylindrical coordinates. So it's still in polar coordinates in the first two dimension. I'm gonna have the possibility of the third dimension because satellites orbital motion happen in three dimension. And I don't know a priori that the object that is orbiting won't end up moving in the third dimension. It might. Um, and there's also some calculation advantages of doing it this way, using the tools that we have so far, particularly the cross product in R3. So we're gonna do this in R3. We have the force of gravity. The force of gravity given by Newton is the gravitational constant times the two masses divided by the distance between them squared. Well, what's the distance between the two masses? It's precisely the length of the vector gamma the radius term of the vector gamma, which is the same as the length of the, of the vector gamma. So the length of gamma squared shows up as the denominator of this force of gravity. This is the scalar force of gravity. I can also ask what direction gravity goes. And to do that, I want the unit direction that gamma is pointing in. So if again, I go back to this diagram, um, my curve, point my curve out here, this direction, I would like the unit direction, that's going to be gamma divided by its length. So that's going to give me the unit direction in the direction of gamma. The force of gravity is exactly the opposite of direction. If I have an object here and a vector going out there, so my big M at the origin, my little M out here, gravity points in exactly the opposite direction. So the direction of gravity is going to be the negative of this unit direction. So it's going to be negative this scalar quantity times this direction. And the direction is gamma over the length, so I can write this as negative gamma divided by the length of gamma cubed, because this u can be replaced with gamma over the length of gamma. There's already a length of gamma squared here, so that gives me a length of gamma cubed. Now, Newton's law says that force is equal to mass times acceleration, so I have to divide out the little mass, then the acceleration on the object is gonna be negative g, the mass at the center, uh, divided by the length of gamma of t cubed, multiplied by gamma of t. This is the equation I'm gonna start with. This is the equation of motion. Newton's physics start with an equation of motion. It's almost always a differential equation. This is also a differential equation, as we'll see shortly. I, I wanted to find something before we go on. I'm gonna define h to be the cross product of gamma with its tangent. 
So again, if I go back here once more, I have gamma, I have its tangent. These are both in two dimensions, so the cross product is going to be something that points in the z direction. So h is going to be some vector in the z direction that's a cross product of gamma and its tangent. And that's going to turn out to be a useful thing to define as gamma moves around. All right, that's the setup. I'm going to define a couple of lemmas here that are going to be useful for the proof that we're going to do. If you're not familiar with the term, a lemma is a little piece of a proof that we do off to the sides so that we can refer to it later. First, I want to say that the vector h, in fact, never changes. That the derivative of h um, is going to be 0. h was defined to be gamma cross gamma prime. Um, the derivative of a cross product, this is, in fact, just a straightforward product rule. So I take the derivative of one cross the other. So this is going to give me the derivative here cross this, and then this cross the derivative of that. Um, so I'm just doing product rule here with a cross product, which does in fact work. Anything cross itself is zero. The cross product of any vector with itself is zero. And the second derivative of position is acceleration. And as I said, the direction of gamma and the direction of the acceleration for gravity are exactly the opposites. So up to a minus sign, these point in the same direction. They're on the same line. And the cross product of any things that are on the same line is zero. So that also gives me a zero. So my first lemma has proved that this vector h, in fact, never changes. Its derivative is zero. Second thing also about the vector h is I could write the vector h as the length of gamma squared times u uh, multiplied by u times u prime. Remember, u is the unit direction in the direction gamma. So I can actually write h in terms of these unit vectors as well. So h by definition is gamma cross gamma prime. I can write gamma as its length times its direction. Any vector can be written as its length times its unit direction. So gamma is length of gamma times u. Gamma prime is the derivative of the length of gamma times u. This is a product rule again. So I differentiate the length of gamma and I differentiate the vector u. Uh, then I've still got this cross product sitting out front. So I can distribute this cross product. So I'm going to get the first piece of the distributed cross product and the second piece of the distributed cross product. And then here what I have is I have a scalar. I have a scalar and a cross product here. So I can write that cross product there. This cross product is u with itself. Anything cross with itself is 0. And what I have here is I have u cross u prime. The scalar can come out. So I have length of gamma times length of gamma. So that's the length of gamma squared. And that's what I wanted to prove, that h was equal to the length of gamma squared times the cross product of these unit directions, u cross u prime. And I'm going to put these two lemmas briefly up here for reference. Now, this might seem pretty strange so far. Why am I doing this? It's not at all clear why these things make any sense at this time. I'm just doing a bunch of weird derivatives with unit directions of vectors. What's going on? Well, these lemmas will be useful later on, but the whole thing is, I admit, a little bit opaque. What's, what's the motivation? It's really hard to see the motivation. And that's often a problem for proofs, is that people play around with these things and find sort of neat patterns with the arithmetic of them. And then suddenly you get this great derivation that shows you these things. So I encourage you to try and follow along with the pieces, follow along step by step with what the operations are doing, but don't worry too much if the, the general narrative of why did you do that doesn't make sense. I did that because it worked. It did, gave me something interesting and led me to some result. Um, I'm playing around with these symbols and the rules I have for manipulating these symbols. I have a couple other lemmas which I'm going to use. These are both from linear algebra. I'm not going to prove them. There's nice a lemma for a triple cross product that I can write in terms of dot products. So I will use this one. There's also a dot product and a cross product lemma. If I have this combination of a dot product and a cross product, I can actually permute the elements of it. It's another thing that I want to do later in the proof. So if I refer to lemmas three and four, the linear algebra lemmas, these are the two rules I'm referring to. All right, let's state and try and prove Kepler's first law. If we start with Newton gravity, which I simplified into this before, this thing has a solution which is a parametric curve with zero z component, so it does in fact stay in a plane of orbit. 
and the relationship between r and theta in the solution to this differential equation is exactly the relationship I defined in video one. And that proves that the shape of the orbit is going to be a conic. And if E is small enough, it will be in fact an ellipse, which is what Kepler saw in the night sky. He saw that the motion of the planets, the motion of these satellites were in fact elliptical. So Kepler's first law is that the shape of this orbit must be a conic. We're gonna prove that by constructing a parametric curve solution and showing that the relationship between these two polar pieces, the radius and the angle, is precisely the polar locus that describes a conic. All right, let's try and prove this. Again, stick with me for this somewhat lengthy video. So let me work with this equation to try and get it in a slightly nicer form, because as it is right now, I can't solve it directly. What I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to use this weird vector h I've defined and take the cross product of both sides with this vector h. Why am I doing this? Geometrically, it's a bit tricky to see. Essentially, I'm doing it because I found out it worked. It gave me a simplification of the differential equation that I perhaps couldn't have seen before. I was just sort of trying things in an effort to replicate the, the stuff that Newton did to try and establish what Kepler's laws were. So I'm just playing around, I'm just trying things, see if I can construct something that gets me somewhere. Uh, I'm going to use the second lemma right away. h is equivalent to length of gamma squared u times u prime. Uh, the scalar can come out of this, and then the scalar can cancel there. So I get a nice cancellation right away, and I get that a cross h is equal to this triple cross product. I have a linear algebra lemma that tells me about a triple cross product. I can calculate it with these special dot products. That was lemma three. Um, u dot u, u is a unit vector. We defined u to be the direction vector for gamma. It was defined specifically to be a vector of length one. So its dot product with itself is one. Any vector that depends on time that remains a unit vector. So u is always a unit vector because I'm always dividing, divided by the length of gamma. Any vector that remains a unit vector, its dot product is going to be perpendicular to itself. This is a thing I mentioned in week seven, perhaps not in the video, I think only in the notes. Um, so go and look in the notes for that reference. But this will always be perpendicular. So a unit vector, something that remains a unit vector and its derivative will always be perpendicular. So that's going to be zero. So that's going to give me uh, zero times u minus one times u prime. So the zero piece goes away, the negatives cancel off. I get that a cross h is going to be gm times u prime. I'm going to calculate this derivative again out of the blue and sort of leave this aside for a moment and start randomly calculating this derivative. Why am I calculating that derivative? Well, it turns out to give me something really valuable and really useful. So that derivative is a product rule derivative. So it's this, derivative of this cross this, and then derivative of this cross this. So the derivative of gamma prime is gamma double prime cross h, and then gamma pr uh, prime cross h prime for the other part of the product rule. The first lemma I have says that h prime has zero derivative. So this is going to be zero. Anything cross zero is zero, so this goes away. And the derivative of the second derivative of a position is exactly acceleration. That's what acceleration is defined to be. So a cross h is equal to the derivative of gamma prime cross h. But now I have a cross h is equal to this, and a cross h is equal to this, so I can make these two things equal. So why am I doing this? I'm doing this to get at this acceleration term. This acceleration term, which is the second derivative position, is the really hard thing for me to handle in this proof. I don't know how to get at it. So now I've made it equivalent to two different things using different processes, and now those two things are the same. So I can change my differential equation into this form. All right, I have a differential equation in this form. Why is this good? Why has this helped me? Why have I done these seemingly meaningless, seemingly weird calculations? Well, this is really good because this is a derivative and this is a derivative. These are both time derivatives. That means I can integrate both sides to get rid of those derivatives. 
I integrate, I get this. I integrate, I get this. Integral of u prime is u. G and m are constants. If I integrate, I introduce constant. And since um, u and gamma are, and, and h for that matter, these are all vectors, I get a vector of constants. So c, c1, c2, c3 is a vector of constants I get from integrating this term by term. All right, this is really good because now I've got I've taken a second order differential equation, something with acceleration, and turned it into a first order equation. Now let me see what I can do with this. Again, I'm gonna do something really weird, totally out of the blue. Why are you doing that? I'm gonna take the dot product with gamma, with this position vector, and see what happens on the right side. So if I take the dot product here, I can distribute the dot product here. I take the dot product with u and the dot product with the constants. Um, Gamma is defined to be length of gamma u. u is the unit direction, so u is gamma divided by its length. So here, this gamma can be written as length of gamma times u. And then here I'm gonna use the dot product formula that says that the dot product is the length of two vectors times the cosine of the angle between them. And this is where I introduce the cosine. So I, I haven't really chosen where my axes are yet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose this so that this cosine is, uh, is referenced to the normal cosine for polar coordinates. And I do that by choosing C to be a vector in the X direction. Why can I do that? Well, C relates to the starting information about my satellite, how, much what, how far away it starts and what velocity it has. And since I haven't chosen how my axes are oriented, I can say, well, let it start on the x-axis. No matter where it's starting, I can draw my axes such that it starts on the x-axis and that the angle from it to gamma is gonna be the ordinary angle of polar coordinates. So I've set this up so that I get the angle of polar coordinates out of this very, very nicely just by a choice of arranging my axes so that the starting position is on the x-axis. All right, so u dot u has to be one. Uh, there should be a gamma there. And then, because u is a unit vector. And then since this is polar coordinates, the length of gamma can be just written as the r in polar coordinates. So let me take these length of gamma terms and just write them as the r in polar coordinates. And then if I solve for r here, if I factor r out of this side and divide by that, I can solve for the r in polar coordinates this way. I still got this numerator that I've got to deal with, and I'll, I'll get to that. It's still a bit confusing, but I'm getting close to what I want. I have r, I have theta. Both of these defend, depend on time as this thing loops around, but I'm getting somewhere. All right, so that's where I was. I want to arrange this a little bit differently. So I'm going to define a number e, which is gonna be the length of C divided by GM. So GM, these are constants. The length of C, this is from the initial conditions. C was the vector of constants I got when I integrated. It came from the initial conditions. So these, this E is gonna depend on where my satellite starts and how quickly it was moving. If I divide and multiply by GM, I can write the expression this way and then C over GM is E, and now I have a GM in each of these terms, so I can factor that out, write that separately over here, and have a one plus E cos theta in the denominator. That was this expression. Now let me finally deal with the numerator. So the numerator is a dot and a cross product. I'm gonna use lemma four. Lemma four says that I can permute the order here. Well, I can permute the order to put the H outside, and then this was the definition of H. So it turns out this numerator is nothing more than h dot h, which is the length of h squared. So I'll do that replacement here. And h is a constant. That's what my first rule said. So I'm going to define another constant to be the length of h squared divided by c, also going to depend on initial conditions. Um, but that means that I can replace the length of h squared if I put c over here with d times c. Then I can move the c over here and this is exactly the expression E, and what I get is that R is equal to ED over one plus E cos theta, which is precisely the form that I wanted. Now that's a pretty strange proof. There's a lot of weird steps, a lot of 
doing random things, but it does in fact eventually produce the thing I really wanted. The relationship between R, R depends on time, theta depends on time, everything else here is a constant. As R and theta change, their relationship is fixed in this pattern. This pattern is precisely the polar locus of a conic, and E is the eccentricity. It depends on the starting values, the starting position and velocity of the object that I have. And it's going to tell me what kind of conic I get if I get something close to a circle, if I get something elliptical. Um, and if the energy is high enough, I could get parabolic or hyperbolic orbits as well. All right, thanks for sticking around for this quite lengthy video trying to prove Kepler's law. The point of all of this is to show how this new description of conics and the tools of parametric curves and their derivatives and their cross products all fit together to give us, starting with Newton gravity, the observed Kepler's law out of that Newton gravity. All we assumed was the force of gravity and the, the mechanics of vector calculus with these parametric curves. From those assumptions, we, are, we were able to say that gravity is going to give us elliptical orbits which is exactly what Kepler observed, which is a remarkable historical piece and connection in mathematics for the subject of calculus. In the next video, we'll try and prove Kepler's next two laws.